see, the question I was thinking of now is uh, this sort of fits right in about the, I was going to ask you about. Let me finish what I was saying? Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> that, uh, i got a few more thoughts on that. So, this is quite different than most people. You might have somebody who has a certain template of a point in mind, but what I have is templates for each stage. Mm -hmm. And not only in my mind, but on these little sketches, there's accumulation of uh, sketches. Uh, uh, and <clears throat> if I, uh, I'm finding if, if the points start to get out of line, I junk it right away and start on another one. No. Like, like Kelterborn says, Helen Brown says, you can waste a lot of time trying to uh, perform acrobatics with the piece. And I think it's better to stay in the middle of the system than to get off track and spend all your time trying to uh, get back on track. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I put the piece aside and then return to the problem piece later when I have uh, more knowledge about how to resolve it. So you just sort of put it away till uh, you, someone someone else, or you might hear about it or think of a way to, to rectify the problem? Yeah, it always comes. It's always a solution that comes in time. And I also would recommend to other people in situations like that where you're up against problems that uh, you're not sure of how to resolve, save the big pieces, the high quality pieces, put them aside. And uh, until you can handle them, until you're sure you can handle them. And work with the smallest pieces first. Mm -hmm. And then when I get a problem, when I get a problem like humps or steps or dips, uh, what I try to do is to come in from the far side, come in from the end, mm -hmm. do a purposeful overshot, or even try to pry the flake button. Mm -hmm. And if I can't do that, I'll hand grind it, I'll grind it off. Yeah. The humps are not the problem, it's the steps. Yeah. As far as the contour is concerned, concerned you can work a lot around the uh, the humps, but uh, the dips uh, create much more problems, especially to the regularity of the flakes when you're doing the, the final the final uh, series. Mm -hmm. That's kind of interesting. And then once I get the pre the, the, the preform flawless for each stage, and if I get it to the last stage, you know, then I shear the edge and grind the edges and then flake away. Mm -hmm. It's all given in my flashcards. Uh, those little flashcards I have show most of my tricks. They're not just for beginners at all, but that's how I do the most of refined and flaky. Yeah. Giving away all my secrets and, uh, <laughs> well, I mean, that's a stupid way to say things, but uh, yeah, I believe in sharing. Yeah. On, uh, on end shock, uh, when you're working, let's say, a long biface, how, how do you do, how do you get around uh, end shock? Is that just uh, being real careful, or do you have a, a method? Well, both. It's a, uh, it's a matter of decision making. It's a matter of, uh, of a few tricks if you get out. And basically, what I try to do is work in such a way I don't need to take flakes from the end. But if I do need to, I'm going to take them as early in reduction to that stage as I can. Mm -hmm. Then if I get stuck, you know, I can come back and take a chance. But basically, I try to work in such a way that I don't have to do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the thing to do to avoid end shock is put tip up against the, uh, get something, you know, old crab tree trick. You, trick. you take a, a soft hammer stone, put it in your lap between your knees, and uh, put the tip, the braided tip against that, and push the bow face into it, then whack away in the end. You rarely break it. Mm. And, uh, or you could push it into a two by four like Flanagan does, or, or any number of other things. Uh, but it's got to be supported at the tip so they won't uh, have lineal wobble. Uh -huh. I saw a Flint and Aberdeen Sawburgers uh, a couple of years ago very arrogant guy. Take this big, beautiful piece of uh, material he was working on a biface and he just sort of held it up in his hand out in front of his face. So I'm gonna, you know, take this uh, end to the thing and I said, you're gonna break that thing because he had no support whatsoever. Uh -huh. And uh, you know, he whacked away and broke it exactly like, uh, you know, he obeyed all the rules for failure. And uh, you know, he didn't seem to care. You know, that, that was really upset me because this big flint that, that size, chirp, whatever, is too hard to come by to have a you know, careless map is destroyed. And simple trick of uh, supporting the end, pushing up against a, a soft stone or a piece of wood would have solved that problem. You say like re rest the face on, on a piece Not of the wood? the face, the tip. The tip, the, the tip, huh? Oh, that's strange. Yeah, just push your tip straight in. So. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, I guess that's... What, what do you do with... Uh, I know that you you sell a lot of your stuff through through coat down. What what else do, do you do? Do you do anything else with your stuff? Well, ninety nine percent of it is marketed to universities and um, museums and research centers and to knife collectors and bow hunters now and this thing and uh, sometimes other nappers. Basically, my customers. And I do almost nothing with that that I don't have orders for. 
you, you don't do you ever make anything that uh, do you have a collection say of your prize stuff or are you pretty much uh, uh, work yeah, I got a few things I got a few things that I have that I want to be buried with yeah and uh, but I don't have uh, I have very little um, I, I rarely make any I had to make a bunch of things to take pictures of for the catalog you know I've got all those but that, that, I don't have a lot else a lot other than that uh -huh. uh, but the interesting thing is uh, since most of uh, my uh, in personal interest in research is with the Danish daggers in recent years what I've tried to do and I, I have I'd really get orders for these Danish daggers I've got to have some practice that's one of the reasons I, I try to market them so I can get some practice so what I'm trying to do is to structure my uh, collector's knives, the types, which I create myself, to coincide with the kinds of information that I want to learn to equip me for the biggies. Yeah. So when I get back over there in a couple of years. So I look up on the knives as basically exercises and, and practice because I feel I have to get double good and work double, double big with obsidian in order to be able to handle the uh, Danish flint. Yeah. When uh, a couple years back, you you were, you were uh, I read I read a couple things about you putting out a book on uh, Danish daggers, uh, photographs and things. Is, is that still in the works, or, or is that uh, aborted? No, it's in the works. I haven't done it yet, though. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I have very little time for doing anything. Well, I spend no, that's not true. I spend half of each day writing and researching. I'm uh -huh. writing a book now on the uh, this Cahokia Pit House project that we did in. Uh, 83, I guess it was, mm -hmm. yeah, 82 and 83, and it's going to be a, a major book, and uh, I don't get to do much in the way of uh, articles, I've had to turn down lots of things, because I don't have time to do it, see, research is a luxury to those who have enough job to, uh, enough uh, job security to afford to be able to take a vacation each day and do research, and I uh, I do it in spite of the fact, but uh, it doesn't allow me to just sit down and have fun. Mm -hmm. but, but what I try to do I, is I know what I'm trying to learn and to get out of this stuff and I structure this into the, uh, the freeform pieces that I have, not the replicas, the true replicas, but the, but the freeform things like the dagger so I can get out of that what I want. Because I believe that this, uh, the whole Neolithic Danish dagger uh, production system, which fell within a very few hundred year period, right at the very end of the Neolithic before bonds came and took over. I'll, I believe that this were, I suspect that this was tied into some kind of organized craft production and, and trade network. And uh, to sort of explain how I got into Piltdown or why I'm going this direction, uh, the uh, one way that I feel I can really uh, come to uh, understand these uh, forces that influence uh, napping decisions uh, back then during the Neolithic period is by immersing myself into commercial traffic. And uh, this I'm doing it legitimately. Mm -hmm. So I create, uh, as it has been done in recent years, but what I do is create my own typology, my own type, and I don't repl replicate the aboriginal designs in these collector's designs. And I'm not even making copies of Danish daggers, but but uh, I, I take my, these new knife designs and, uh, and uh, well, in fact, I'm about to, uh, by aiming at the knife collectors rather than artifact collectors, which I want to stay as far away from artifact collectors as I can. I'm not interested in, in selling anything to them. Uh -huh. But it's interesting, you know, in my work to see how economics has forced me to streamline, to shortcut, to economize uh -huh. in these knives. And what this results is a progressively more regular pattern. The so called, uh, and, you know, so called beautiful knives. Mm. This has very little to do with beauty, actually. It's because it's, a, it's the tricks that I'm doing to make these more regular, time-saving, and to me, time is money. Mm. So, it's, uh, so once, upon, once I stumble on these tricks to uh, ways to save time, and I can notice that it uh, does make the knife beautiful at the same time, then I capitalize upon that as, long, you know, as much as I can, so it, as long as it doesn't become a waste of time. Mm. I never just uh, elaborate just to decorate. Yeah. Uh, the things that I do have to be functional, either in terms of cutting efficiency or time cutting efficiency. Mm -hmm. There was something else about the, these knives that uh, I could add. Uh, when I'm doing this final flanking on these knives, say I've got all these preforms up to, you know, I've got eight or ten preforms that have worked through the 
all the way through the stages I'm ready to do it. I work on, I try to work on the conditions of total control of the, uh, of my environment. You know, I work by myself, up in my study, no noise, put on some classical music and, uh, you know, proper ventilation and all that stuff. And I, I want a block of several hours, uh, uninterrupted work. Mm -hmm. And, uh, during this time I have total concentration. It's like meditation. So I go, after I go through all these mental preparations that are, which I mentioned in the, the two microblade articles that I've uh, written, uh, one can have lithic technology, the one coming out uh, any day now in this uh, journal of Danish archaeology, in which I also detail in these flashcards. Mm -hmm. I simply just run through the series. And I do this as slowly and as carefully as I can uh, to do it. I don't try for a certain pace or tempo or rhythm, but it's basically a pure meditation. Uh -huh. I try to replicate the last flake in the last series as well as I can. And I do that from knife after knife. Mm -hmm. That's the value to me of an addition of knives when I'm trying to make them all the same. I can take off thousands and thousands of flakes trying to make each one nearly identical. And I enjoy this. When I'm working with knives and scalpels, mm -hmm. it's a, it, it creates a body of work, which to me is more interesting and exciting than uh, just doing individual things. Mm -hmm. I, I can see... Uh, well, it's the ultimate interest in and how much de how much work have you done actually uh, using your your items in experimentation like uh, the uh, the map I guess it was a buffalo experiment or uh, the no it was an elephant experiment near the Smithsonian and uh, what else have you done along that line <laughs> which so many animals I can begin to count oh that do, do you do you analyze the, the tool edges afterwards I'm right. saving for analysis. I do very little myself. Uh -huh. And uh, but you know what I do is like meticulous records. I keep on everything. I uh, I bag these things and log them. So if some day somebody wants to come along, they can be able to reconstruct. I think you should do experiments in such a a manner that that somebody else can come along and pick up where you left off, look over your data, and be able to replicate what you did, replicate, uh -huh. duplicate your actions. <clears throat> I was doing this, as, you know, you know, way, way back in time, but, but especially since I started teaching in 71 at uh, Virginia Commonwealth University. Here, we would, uh, you know, I had the students do it because I was doing this all at the same time. I was sort of leading them on. We were going to make these hand axes and, you know, cut down trees and build shelters and, and uh, with bows and arrows, perhaps another thing to uh, get animals or otherwise carcasses and butcher them mm -hmm. and stuff like that, butcher, you know, many, many butcher and uh, all sorts of smaller game. I don't know if you're familiar with these uh, eight publications, but in the, that stands for Experimental Archaeology Papers. Uh, in uh, 1972, I did the first of these uh, summer programs, field schools, and what I call living archaeology, and that is going out into a, a, a site, setting up a campsite a complex, trying to uh, simulate uh, the uh, particular culture in the past, which has done many different things, and, uh, you know, just basically live off the land using the tools that were available back at the time. Mm -hmm. We lived just like, like the people did. We didn't dress up and play Indian or anything like that. We just wore, wore the same clothes, but, and we were doing research and keeping records and stuff. But in 72, we uh, went out for a two-week period, built a house, and uh, lived in it. All, everything was stone tools. We even, all the, the, the stone tools were made with stone, with other tools and everything. We didn't use metal axes to make the, the handles to the hats and so forth. Mm -hmm. It was pure. Uh, lived off the land, hunting, gathering. Uh, you know, I've done a lot of work with edible plants and stuff. And uh, we did this in, in periods that were very, usually between a month 